Hi, everybody. This is part four of four in a series on Christian mysticism. In previous episodes, we've looked at the work of Pseudo Dionysius and his introduction of negative theology. That is that we have to claim that we have to go beyond concepts or reasons in order to achieve unity with God. We looked at the work of Meister Eckhart, especially focusing on his notion of detachment as the most important of the virtues, that is, detachment from all created things, including our own identities. Uh, and then we looked at Teresa of Avila, a beautiful work, The Interior Castle, where she describes the soul as consisting of seven dwellings, in the center of which resides God, uh, with whom we are granted a kind of divine union. In this final uh, episode, we're going to be looking at the work of St. John of the Cross, uh, who was a, not only a contemporary of Teresa of Avila, but, but a close associate. They worked together in ways that we will discuss in the uh, remarks to follow. And I think we'll find that John of the Cross really brings together a lot of the themes that we've seen unfolded in this series, and I hope you find it to be interesting. <clears throat> Here we have an image of, of John of the Cross, and as I described in the last episode about Teresa of Avila, this seems to be by a contemporary artist and, and really brings out some of the personality, I think, in ways that earlier depictions of John in this iconic form um, might not do. The image um, behind the icon of John of the Cross is Mount Carmel in what is now Israel. Uh, Mount Carmel symbolizes for John of the Cross, the ascent of the soul to God, that you're physically ascending this mountain, you're going up to the peak, right? And at the peak, there is this potential that is granted to us of union with God. Um, John of the Cross was a Carmelite, um, devoted uh, to the, the Carmelite order, uh, and, and worked to reform that order along with Teresa of Avila, as we'll see. Uh, so, he was born in 1542, um, Juan de Jepes y Alvarez, um, and when he was, what would it be, 25 years old, he met Teresa of Avila. I mean, Teresa so was a bit his senior, and was really established by that point um, as a spiritual teacher and as a reformer within the Carmelite order. Remember, the Protestant Reformation uh, is happening at this very same time, and what we call the Counter-Reformation, or the Catholic Reformation, is also beginning to unfold in response to that. Um, so, um, Teresa and John worked together to found a new monastery for men based on the principles uh, taught by Teresa of Avila. Both of them were very involved in, in the day-to-day -day operations and, again, reform of the Carmelite order. Um, it was in 1575 um, that John composed the poem, The Dark Night. Um, we're going to look at that in its, in its entirety uh, in a couple of slides that became the basis for his works, The Ascent of Mount Carmel and The Dark Night of the Soul, which will be our main focus in what follows. He also made a sketch of the cross that we'll be taking a look at and discussing in a few moments. Um, the, however, uh, now their reforms of the Carmelite order were not well received by, by other Carmelites. There's a funny distinction, I think we have it on the next slide here, um, between the Chalced Carmelites and the Discalced Carmelites. So the Chalced Carmelites wore shoes, and the Discalced Carmelites did not wear shoes. That's what the words Chalced and Discalced mean. Um, so the tensions resulting from these reforms led to John being taken captive as a prisoner in 1577. He was put in jail in a monastery. He was also publicly lashed. Um, and uh, was able finally to form this Discalced Carmelite order upon his release in, in 1580 and had about a decade working with them um, before his death in, in 1591, just a little after Teresa of Avila. So really both of these figures are solidly figures of the 16th century, of the Catholic Reformation. They're actors as well as thinkers. They were active in the political conflicts of their time, and it's worth bearing that in mind as you consider all that they're saying about the spiritual life and the inner life and, and things of that kind. So here we have an image of John of the Cross in 
prison, and here he's having a vision of the Virgin Mary, and you can tell it's a probably a little after the 16th century, but it's it's an older image um, depicting angels and playing instruments. Um, this is an experience that John described having in prison amidst his public lashings and torment and 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 really, you know, being um, subjected to quite a punishment from his fellow Carmelites in a monastery. Um, it was remarkable that he had, even in such circumstances, such a spiritual experience. One of the things that caused that spiritual experience is this image on the left. Now, this is by John of the Cross himself, in his hand, a sketch of Christ on the cross, right? So he, in his prison cell, was up in an upper floor of the monastery, and he looked down and saw the crucifix, Christ on the cross, from above. This was important. This led him to reflect on what the event of the crucifixion might have physically looked like to God. Right? If God were looking down, what is the perspective that God has on the world and on the things of this world, things that are uh, leading to, to circumstances like his captivity and, and torture? This image of Christ on the cross uh, inspired the cross here of John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, whom we'll be reading a bit later in the course. John Paul II wrote one of his doctoral dissertations. He wrote two of them uh, on John of the cross and was really devoted to this image of the dark night of the soul as an as a, a illustration of the spiritual life. And uh, this, this image of Christ kind of sagging on the cross and, and, and how the world is pulling us down, and yet it's possible to, to through that lowliness, um, rise up and, and um, by the grace of God, achieve this, this kind of peace and, and unity and, and um, consummation that John describes in his work. I want to take a, a minute here to look at this verse. Um, so this is a translation of the actual poem that John wrote. Um, he was inspired by that vision of the cross um, to move into this, this more kind of mystical style of writing. Um, also the experiences of, of prayer that he was having as a member of this of this Carmelite order. Um, I think the best way to approach this is just to take a look at it. We'll go stanza by stanza and I'll offer some, some comments. So please, please read along. One dark night, he begins, fired with love's urgent longings. Ah, the sheer grace. I went out unseen, my house being now all stilled. Right? The sheer grace. Grace here means that John is acting not by his own effort, but he's being led. He's being given the strength or the prompting to do what he's doing by God. Right? In darkness and secure by the secret ladder, disguised, ah, the sheer grace. In darkness and concealment, my house being now all stilled. Right? We have that repetition, my house being stilled. Right? The house here is a representation of John's worldly concerns, the things that are preoccupying him, the, the attachments that he has, the worries that he has, right? These things are stilled as he moves out into this darkness. On that glad night in secret, where no one saw me, nor did I look at anything with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart, right? And one there is capitalized because that is a reference to, to God who is the one thing that John is guided by here, by no worldly thing, by no earthly thing. This guided me more surely than the light of noon to where he was awaiting me, him I knew so well, there in a place where no one appeared, right? who was waiting for him. This is Christ waiting for him. Right? O guiding night, O oh, night more lovely than the dawn, O oh, night that has united the lover with his beloved, transforming the beloved into his lover. Here we have again that imagery of intimate union repeated from Teresa of Avila. Upon my flowering breast, 
which I kept holy for him alone, there he lay sleeping, and I caressing him, there in a breeze from the fanning cedars. When the breeze blew from the turret as I parted his hair, it wounded my neck with its gentle hand, suspending all my senses, the breeze wounding his neck. I abandoned and forgot myself, laying my face on my beloved. All things ceased. I went out from myself, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. I went out from myself. All things ceased. Right? John goes out from his house, figuratively here, the cares of his life. He goes into this night. He goes into this darkness. He's drawn by the urgent longings, right, placed in him by God. He encounters the beloved. He encounters God, right? He experiences this intimacy of connection with God, and he is left satisfied. He is left with his, his cares do not return, right? That the all things cease and his cares are forgotten. So now this poem is the basis for the book that bears the title, The Dark Night, and it's called typically The Dark Night of the Soul. And the whole book, The Dark Night, kind of unpacks different portions of this poem, which is why we've spent a little time with it here. Here we have an image um, from the title slide, so we've already talked a bit about this, of Mount Carmel. Um, so this is um, the representation for John. The ascent of this mountain will be the ascent of his soul to God in the context of that dark night. Now, how do we do this here? Ah, oh, yes, right. So here we have two images. Um, the one on the left, I believe, is in John's own hand. And the one on the right is a, a published version of that that's roughly contemporary with the initial publication of this book. Now, what are these things, you might say? They're kind of diagram, right? So just as we looked at the image of Teresa of Avila's seven dwellings in the interior castle, here we're looking at an image drawn by John himself of the journey of the soul up Mount Carmel, right? Symbolically up this mountain to its union with God. What we have here is something I would, I would like to thank the internet person for. Thank you very much um, for this image. It's very helpful. This translates the Spanish into English and, of course, makes it quite a bit more readable. Um, I'll talk through all of this briefly because, again, this is based on the image of John himself. This is a synoptic picture. This is a full picture of the journey as he sees it. Um, let's start by looking at the very bottom here. So this is taken from the very bottom of the image. Is it there? No, oh, it's there. It's over there, right? But now we're going to look at it up here. That's funny. In order to enjoy, know, possess, and be everything, desire to enjoy, know, possess, and be nothing. You must continue on the way without enjoying, without knowing, without possessing. You must follow the path on which you are nothing. This is known as the way of the nada. John of the Cross's way of the nada, the way of nothing. Let's take a look at this. So to progress on the path, you must progress without enjoying, without knowing, without possessing. Let's take a look down at the bottom on those three kind of paths. It looks like there are three peaks, right? And each one is, is leading upward. So we have on the far left, honor, repose, taste, liberty, and science, right? And the guy <laughs> depicted on the slide there, little figure, gets to the top, and there's nowhere to go. Right? You're at the top of a mountain, but there's nowhere to go from there. On the far right, we have glory, security, joy, consolation, 
and knowledge, right? All good things, right? Um, and those things also lead to the top of a mountain and also um, uh, do not lead anywhere, right? They will not get you to the goal you seek, which is God himself, in himself, as he is in his essence, right? The only way that will get you up, it's not the goods of the earth, it's the first little path we looked at, and it's not the goods of heaven, second path, it's only the center way. And the narrow center way is labeled nothing, 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 right? Nada, 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 nada. Only when you leave aside all of your attachments to, belief in, confidence in, physical things of the world, values of the world, even as we'll see spiritual things, right? Only when all of that is left aside are you able to reach God as God is in God's self. Let's take a look at what's above there, right? Wrapping around on the outside, we have, and here there is no way, as for the just man there is no law. He is a law unto himself, right? What does that mean? If I, I can just do anything I want, right? If I am a just man, if I am a person, human being, man or woman, who is acting justly, right? Then I will be a law unto myself insofar as I truly am a just person, right? So I'm not following a law outside of me. I have begun to, be, to have that intimacy with God where I'm living out justice, right? Just because of who I am, not because I'm following an exterior law, right? So we have all of these virtues lined up around here. Piety, justice, counsel, prudence, understanding, faith, charity, wisdom, hope, knowledge, fortitude, temperance, fear of the Lord. And on the mountain, it says here, I brought you into the land of Carmel to eat the fruit thereof and the best things thereof. Right? That's a line from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2. And at the very center of all of those virtues, right? you're no longer following an exterior law, you have this perpetual banquet, divine silence, divine wisdom, and finally, only the honor and glory of God remains. Right? I've left aside all earthly goods, all spiritual goods. I followed the path of the nada, the path of, of detachment from everything. And that has yielded to me, by God's grace, this vision of God in himself, only the honor and glory of God. Right? This, for John of the Cross, is the spiritual path. This is what he lays out in his book, The Ascent of Mount Carmel. This is what he has in mind when he writes the poem called The Dark Knight. And this is what he's commenting on when he writes that book, um, which is the commentary on the poem. So we're going to look briefly at some passages here from The Ascent of Mount Carmel and The Dark Knight of the Soul. And, and these are two excellent translations, as it happens, um, the one on the left from E. Allison Piers. Piers is a, a well-known translator of mystical texts from the early 20th century. And on the left, we, uh, on the right, we have this um, translation by Mirabai Starr, um, and we used um, Starr's translation of the interior castle, which we found to be, remember, very helpful. Um, what we're using actually this time is a paraphrase, and that's what we're going to be relying on um, by a, a fellow named Menninger, very useful work, uh, making this uh, text by John of the Cross accessible to non-specialists, right? So we don't have to fight through the, the, uh, the, the language of the text. We're able, just with Menninger's help, to get at the kind of spiritual, so to speak, message of the text, and that, that is our concern in this course. So John's dark night of the soul, what is the dark night of the soul? In short, this is a process whereby we leave aside our confidence in and attachment to all created things, and we rely only on God alone, only on God alone. We leave aside even spiritual things and even our ideas about God himself. 
And that's what makes this way of John of the Cross, the way of the nada, of the nothing, so very interesting. He's not only saying, you know, don't be greedy, don't be lustful, right? Those are important things. Don't be greedy or lustful. But he's saying that once you've, you've made those first moves, you need to also leave aside all these other things that we, we tend to become attached to as we follow in a spiritual path. Let's take a look at these three stages or aspects of this dark night. The first he calls the dark night of the senses, right? This is renouncing worldly things. So we're leaving behind our attachments to, you know, money, power, fame, th this kind of thing. The things that Thomas Aquinas talked about is, is not making us happy, right? But then we need to actually do what Thomas Aquinas said. We need also to see that spiritual things, intellectual things, will not make us happy, right? That God is not to be found in those things. So we move from the dark night of the senses into the dark night of the spirit, right? And there we renounce our attachment even to spiritual things, the, the language of doctrines and dogmas and such things. Again, those remain as part of positive theology, the revealed, church, uh, revealed truth of the church. But we're able, through what we're calling this negative theology, apophatic theology, right, to see that God is beyond those things, those concepts and ideas, and that the only way to be granted uh, through grace, that union with God, is by leaving aside our attachment to those worldly things. Finally, the dark night of God himself. Uh, we have a line here from, um, from the text. God communicates himself by faith to the soul in a secret manner that becomes another night to the soul. This night is far darker than the others are and is followed by a complete union with the wisdom of God, who is Jesus. Right? This is the darkest of nights. Only when we leave behind our preconceived ideas, even of God, to apprehend, as it were, the reality of God himself, only then are we really reaching the culmination of the spiritual path. So what we'll do now is look at some passages, some from the Ascent of Mount Carmel and just a couple from from Dark Night of the Soul, and talk through how John unfolds these um, elements of his presentation. We start with the very beginning of the Ascent to Mount Carmel, and he's basically talking about, if you want to get started, what do you have? What do you, what do you need to get started, right? Four things are necessary, he says. To explain the dark night through which the soul must pass in order to attain perfect union with God, and so far as it's possible in this life, Four things are necessary. One must have knowledge, experience, understanding of the scriptures, and fidelity to the sound teachings of the church. Many souls, when they set out upon the spiritual journey, are graced by God to do so, but make no progress. They must allow themselves to be led by God through a dark night of trials and aridity, dryness, temptations, and hardships. They make no progress because they do not desire to enter into this dark night or because they do not understand themselves or because they lack competent spiritual directors to guide them. Two things I'd point out here. Number one, we, we, we're talking about this in a kind of spiritual register, so to speak, and I've used the phrase spiritual journey, but John of the Cross is not saying that we just leave behind religion, right? Because today we make this distinction between spirituality and religion. For him, all of what we're talking about occurs within the context of, if you want, positive theology, right? The teaching of the church, the scriptures, right? You need a spiritual director. You need someone to, to give you advice along the way and, and to help you discern what is the right path uh, forward for you. Um, so there's a structure that he's introducing here. The second point is this willingness he talks about to go into these periods of dryness. He uses his term aridity, right? I mean, often, and he talks about this a bit in the text, someone is converted to a, a religion, whatever the religion may be. In this case, we're talking about the Catholic Church, right? So you, you become Catholic, you're baptized, and there's this great zeal, this energy, this passion, right? You, you have such an enthusiasm for your new faith. 
and maybe you even feel that there's a dramatic transformation, that you're really, you know, a new person. And that's a beautiful thing. However, over time, you very often enter a period of dryness, a period where God feels absent. There's actually a term for that in theology, a Latin term, deus absconditus. God has absconded. God has moved away from us, has hidden himself from us, right? So at that time, you might stop making progress. These consolations, as Teresa talked about, we discussed that in the last episode, are no longer being given to you, right? And so you need to persist in this dark night. You need to keep on the path, even though you don't even feel God's presence. You don't even know if God exists, right? So why are you even doing it? That persistence is what will enable you to make progress, according to John of the Cross. We need also to be sure that when we're going through this period of dryness or the psychological challenge, that it is actually a spiritual experience. I mean, there are lots of things that might lead us to have that kind of experience. Um, so is it a dark night? Right? With God's help, John writes, we will look at the signs that will tell us whether a soul is undergoing the dark night or whether it be the dark night of the sense or of the spirit or some psychological problem or even some hidden sins. There are many other things on this road that may happen to those who follow it, both consolations and desolations, that is, comforting things and discomforting things, some coming from the guiding hands of God and others from our own imperfections. Right? So just because you're having what feels like a spiritual experience, you could actually be dealing with some other kind of thing entirely, right? And this is part of why John emphasizes right in the very beginning of the book the need for a spiritual director, right? Someone who can kind of walk with you on that path. I mean, very often these days, a therapist might serve in that role. In John's context, it would have been a spiritual director. So we made the distinction above already between the senses and the spirit. So let's return to that. The first purgation, John writes, is the dark night of the senses. Now, to purge means to, to let something out of yourself, right? So we use the phrase, for example, binge and purge, right? To purge is to, is to release what you have uh, consumed. Um, in this case, the, what you're purging are your attachments to and identifications with the things of this world, right? Created things in the spirit of what we've seen since Dionysius, right? And he's, he's drawing us away from that created many up toward this union with God who is the one. The second purification, like purgation, right, is the dark night of the spirit. In both cases, it is the soul that undergoes the dark night, but through its different parts, first the sensual part and then the spiritual part. The night of the senses pertains to beginners and occurs when God begins to bring them into the state of contemplation. Right? So I just, I just got to the monastery. Hey man, how you doing? What's up? Right? I don't know what's happening yet. I need to become aware of my attachments. I need to face them. I need to begin the process of, of transcending them. The night of the spirit or purification pertains to those who are already proficient and occurs when God wishes to bring them to a higher state of union. Right? So this is almost like what we saw in Teresa of Avila with dwellings one through three is focusing on ascetic practices, right? It's your effort who's kind of severing those connections with earthly things. I mean, it's always God's effort in this tradition, but you're actively playing a role. Uh, whereas that night of the spirit purification, that's kind of like dwellings four through seven, right? You're being led higher and higher. You're, you're going, or if you like, deeper and deeper, right, into this spiritual journey, and the active party is God. You're being drawn forward by God. I think this night of the Spirit is, is really interesting because it is suggesting, as I've said already above, that being attached even to spiritual stuff, icons, pictures, crosses, readings, the Bible, right? Even that can be an obstacle to you. Let's see what he says here. Detachment even from spiritual things. The soul now moves on from stripping itself of all sensual imperfections to stripping itself of all desires. 
for the possession of even spiritual things. It is much more difficult to put to rest the spiritual part of the soul and its desires and to enter into this interior darkness, the dark night of the spirit, which is a spiritual detachment from all things, whether sensual or spiritual, and leaning on pure faith alone. Pause. This is hard. This is hard to do because, you know, you, you might become, become Catholic, convert, right? And, and, and you enter into Catholic culture and podcasts and YouTube and you're reading books, and Chesterton and Merton, and you're, you're feeling very Catholic, right? But if you're attached to those things and you're attached to that kind of fixation on that identity over against other identities, for purposes of this mystical path, you will be unable to make progress, right? That doesn't mean that those identifications are not important or the Catholic tradition is not important, far from it. That's what he emphasizes at the beginning. You need those things, right? But you need also in the context of those things to be able to see your way beyond them and not to be inwardly attached to them. He continues, this spiritual darkness, which is faith, takes away from the soul everything that it might understand and that it might sense. Nothing is seen. The soul does not move forward under its own power, but only with the power of God. Right? Again, that's what we saw in Teresa of Avila. You're being drawn now by a power beyond yourself in those later, in those inner dwellings, right, of the of the soul. Nothing is seen. You're relying on no created thing, and you're leaving aside even your own sense of separate identity. This one is using this word unknowing. And I think this is a, an important passage to connect John of the Cross with some of what we saw earlier in Dionysius and, and Eckhart especially. God can only be known by unknowing. In this life, the highest thing that can be felt or experienced concerning God is infinitely removed from God. Wait, pause. What is he saying? Nothing on the, the altar at the Vatican, right? The, the relic of St. Peter, the, the, the Bible in its original manuscript. None of those things are even close to God in God's self, in God's essence. They're infinitely removed from God, right? However much the soul may desire to be perfectly united through grace with God in this life, it must be in darkness with respect to everything that can enter through the senses, which can be imagined with the fancy or understood with the heart. The senses, the imagination, and the understanding. What God is in God's self transcends all those things. If you want to encounter God in God's self, you must leave aside those things. Should the soul cling to any of these things, it will be greatly impeded from reaching union with God. God lies beyond all these things, even the highest that can be known or experienced. God can only be known by unknowing. God can only be known by unknowing. We have to unknow the things we think we know, including our own identity and identities, right? There's an emptying of self. The term for this in Greek is kenosis, right? We say that Jesus Christ emptied himself on the cross. The term for that is kenosis, right? It, his individual identity, he sacrificed that. He was willing to give that up. And that willingness enabled him, as we saw with Eckhart too, emptying himself, he was able to for God to fully um, pour himself in. Well, the case of Christ is kind of complex because he's the son of God, second person in the Trinity, things like that. But let's leave Christ aside. For us, that's how it works, according to these authors. Purgation, illumination, and unity. So the last portion of our assigned selection is not from the Ascent of Mount Carmel. Everything we've seen so far is from the book, The Ascent of Mount Carmel. This is from The Dark Night of the Soul, the work in which John is commenting stage by stage on the poem that we read earlier in the lecture. Um, here we have um, some new language used for the night of the senses, the dark night of the spirit, and the dark night of, of God, uh, the three parts that we identified above. He writes, 
Souls that are beginning the journey to union with God are said to be in the purgative way. We're purging ourselves of those attachments. The usual form of prayer for this way is verbal or discursive meditation, sometimes called mental prayer. Maybe you're saying the Our Father. Maybe you're reading prayers aloud at this stage. God gradually brings them from this purgative way to the state of contemplation called the illuminative way. Pause. That's our second stage. That's the dark night of the spirit, right? We're being brought beyond the language of the prayers to a deeper contemplation of what they mean, right? And finally, God brings the um, practitioner here um, to the state of perfection called the unitive way, begun here but completed in heaven. No living person can be fully united with God, but in heaven, which is defined as a state of union with God, right, uh, we are able to achieve that. So, so this process is begun in this life and completed, we would say, in the next. What's interesting about this portion, we're not going to go into all the, all the detail about this here, but you'll see in the reading that John discusses, I'll, I'll just list them off here. These are some of the vices he discusses. Pride, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, sloth, and envy. Right? Well, I think what you'll find really interesting, he writes about these as dangers for a person on the spiritual path. So he's not talking to people who haven't even begun the spiritual path. You know, they've never picked up a Bible, never heard of God. All they want is fame and money or something like this, right? He's not talking to those people. He's talking to people who think they're really holy, who think that they are advanced on this spiritual path. And he's identifying these as dangers that can beset such a person, right? Spiritual pride. I think I have greater insight than you, right? Or spiritual gluttony. I just want to keep consuming religious stuff all the time, right? Interesting discussions here of these vices. Um, just a couple more slides here. I think we have three total on, on the dark night of the soul. Um, you know, this dark night is a painful experience. God is Deus absconditus, the hidden God, right? Why would God do this to us? We have a passage, this dark night purifies the soul, but it does so through love, because this is the only way God acts, that is through love. Perhaps this is what is sometimes known as tough love, John writes. This dark contemplation gives the soul both love and wisdom according to its capacity and its need. Angels receive the wisdom of God and his love in sweetness and light, because they are pure spirits, and this is their mode of being. Men and women, however, receive wisdom and light through darkness in anguish, because of their feebleness, because of their weakness, right? Through a gradual purification, they become capable of receiving this love and wisdom in tranquility. So, we are not angels, <laughs> and we never will be, by the way. You don't become an angel uh, when, when you die, contrary to, to popular belief. At least, it's not the teaching of the Catholic Church that you do. We have to go through this darkness. We suffer this anguish because of our weakness individually, right? As people, we, we have this, this weakness. We're material beings. We, we desire um, physical comforts and, and recognition. We have social desires, right? We want to be famous or something like this. Um, and what John is suggesting here is that this is why we need to be purged and purified before we can achieve that unity. And I say achieve, but I should mean granted. Um, and in fact, that works as a transition to our very last slide, the sheer grace. So this is from the very end of our selection from the text, I think an especially beautiful passage. Once one's nearsightedness is expelled by the purgings of this dark night, the immense benefits acquired will begin to appear. The intellect and the will become illumined they're lit up with supernatural light, united with the divine. A divine conversion takes place, changing the memory, the affections, that's the feelings, and the appetites according to God. The soul becomes more divine than human. Again, all of this is sheer grace. Remember from the poem, ah, the sheer grace, the sheer grace. Sheer means 
absolutely like a sheer side of a cliff, you know, very, very smooth side of a cliff. The sheer grace. This means that nothing that we're doing is making us like, like a piano virtuoso or something, right? I mean, we're, it's all because I'm so naturally talented. No, everything that's happening to us from this point of view, uh, that is the point of view of these authors, is because of sheer grace. God has enabled it to happen. God wills that it should happen, and thus it does, right? We change through this spiritual journey, according to John of the Cross. We leave aside our attachment to things of the senses, our attachment to things of the spirit, even our attachment to ideas about God. Through this dark night, we suffer our way toward a transformation, right? The memory, the feelings, the appetites, all of these things are aligned according to God, right? We, we become that butterfly that Teresa of Avila talked about. God is born in our soul, as Eckhart talks about. And we return by a transcendence to the one, to the source of our being, as Dionysius talked about. This is the Catholic, well, I shouldn't say Catholic, this is the Christian mystical tradition. All of this uh, is very much shared across various Christian denominations uh, and, and is, in, in addition, of, of special and deep significance um, to many Catholics. Thank you very much to this, uh, for your attention to this four-part series on Christian mysticism. If you haven't seen the other episodes yet, please do go back and check them out. I do hope you found something here to contemplate and something that you will find useful.